My name is Tim Montague. Welcome to SolarWorks for Illinois. Today is October 30th, and this is our monthly free webinar brought to you by Continental Electrical. Continental is a electrical contractor and solar installer here in Chicagoland. And today we are going to have a presentation by Travis Simpkins on maximizing your solar investment by adding battery energy storage. Travis is the founder and uh, chief technology officer uh, at NewGrid, and he's a recognized expert in the design, modeling, and economic optimization of microgrids. He's currently chief technology officer at NewGrid Analytics, which provides design analysis and economic optimization of renewable energy and energy storage projects. He has also developed a tool called Red Cloud Energy, uh, sorry, Red Cloud, uh, that is an energy optimization platform. Prior to MuGrid, Travis was a senior engineer at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, where he analyzed microgrids at dozens of private and public sites. Travis holds a PhD in electrical, electrical engineering and computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a certificate of financial engineering from the MIT Sloan School of Management, as well as a BS in electrical engineering and applied physics from Case Western University. He is a senior member of the IEEE and has published numerous technical papers in a variety of fields. With that, I will let you take it away, Travis. Thank you very much, Tim, for the, uh, the great introduction. I'm certainly glad to uh, join you at your webinar today and uh, all of our, uh, our listeners. Um, it's, uh, it's very exciting for me uh, to, uh, to join you, uh, to hear about what you guys are doing in uh, Illinois and see the great stuff going on. Um, although we are a Colorado company, my uh, background, I'm originally from Ohio, and my wife and business partner is from Michigan. So certainly uh, exciting to uh, see what's going on in the Midwest in solar and, um, you know, in the course of uh, storage. So like Tim said, um, today we're going to uh, talk about uh, maximizing your solar investment by adding battery energy storage. First, a uh, couple of words uh, more about uh, MuGrid Analytics. Um, here at MuGrid, we solve wicked hard problems at the intersection of energy technology and economics using math and modeling. I like to say that we operate at the intersection of how a technology works and how a technology makes money. Really, that's uh, what we see is, you know, what drives project development. Being able to do projects is that combination of, of the technology and the economic side. We are a tech and consulting company that is focused on providing bankable techno-economic analysis of renewable energy, energy storage, and microgrid projects to developers, financiers, component manufacturers, property owners, and really just about anyone else that wants to understand the bottom line of how their technology can work and how it can help them achieve their energy goals at their organization. Like Tim mentioned, we've developed our own modeling platform that we call Red Cloud. Um, we use a lot of uh, mathematical optimization that's uh, really interesting and to, uh, to solve uh, you know, some very interesting uh, problems that uh, you know, we'll get to uh, look at momentarily. To give you uh, a couple of ideas of uh, you know, what we think are the key takeaways um, you know, from this presentation, uh, you know, for it's, uh, you know, first batteries can enhance the economics of a solar project with multiple revenue streams. These multiple revenue streams make optimal battery dispatching a fairly hard problem but interesting problem to solve. And the key to economic solar plus storage is this effective dispatching. This is really what can make or break um, projects um, and getting them to, uh, to pencil. So I know that there is a lot of folks uh, that, are, um, that have done solar for a number of years and are getting excited about adding storage to their projects. And so I like to talk a little bit about you know, the mindset shift that you need to undertake as you start to get into the battery world. And so to start out, um, I usually say that solar is pretty straightforward. Um, you basically can put panels on your roof, the sun shines, you make electricity, electrons flow, and you save money. 
you know, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that in the end, but, you know, relatively speaking, that's what happens. You don't really have to think about it. It just, the sun shines and it does its thing. Batteries, on the other hand, require decisions. If I just stick a battery in a shed out back, nothing's going to happen. I'm not going to save any money. I'm not going to make any money. I have to decide when to charge that battery, when to discharge it, what sources to charge it from, and a lot of other decisions that are either going into, you know, from some human or is getting programmed into con some controller. The point is, is that if I don't think about it, this, is, this battery isn't actually going to, to do anything for me. So how do we deal with that complexity? Well, here at MuGrid, we approach it with mathematical optimization. We like to say that every time there was a decision to make, there was something optimal that you should have done. Every point throughout the year, every 15 minute block of time, there is a best use for your battery. There is a best use that will get you the maximum economic return. And of course, we're never gonna get perfect with that dispatching, but the closer we get to it, the better chance that our project has of penciling and achieving satisfactory economic performance. So thinking about what are these decisions, I like to start out with a battery as a bucket because that's really what it is. A battery is a bucket that's storing charge for us, right? And so if we were thinking about a bucket, you know, what decisions do we need to make with this bucket? Well, we should want to think about how big of a bucket we need. When do we want to fill it? When do we want to empty it? To help us think through that, we have some considerations over here, like how fast can we fill it? How fast can we empty it? How much is the bucket going to cost? How long will it last? And what would cause it to fail? Of course, the energy that we take out of it must be worth more than the energy we put in. That's probably a fairly seems obvious statement, but in reality, that's what drives all of our battery economics, is we always want to be getting more value out of it than we needed to put into to be able to charge the battery. Oh, and lastly, we should always remember that this battery is, is not a perfect bucket. It will leak over time due to efficiency considerations. So one of the key points that, uh, you know, another, that I think is, you know, a very good takeaway, you know, for guys that are getting started um, in the battery space is understanding battery power versus battery energy. And this is, I will be, tell you, is not that will always presented that well in the media. And so first of all, power is, you know, how fast you can charge or discharge this battery. Whereas capacity is how much can it store? And so, if you take those, you can then end up with duration down here. That is, how long can the battery sustain its rated power output? And so if I have an eight megawatt hour battery, and so that's the capacity, megawatt hours, and I have a two megawatt power converter system, you know, some sort of bidirectional inverter there, you could say, well, I have eight megawatt hours and I have a two megawatt power system, so I can sustain that two megawatts for four hours, and that then gives me a four hour duration for this energy storage system. So to liken this back a little bit to our bucket analogy, I'm gonna ask which of these containers is more useful? Well, depending on what you wanna do with them, you know, it could be either one, right? You know, this big barrel at the top could be very useful to you if you are on a desert island and you need a lot of capacity to store water. But, if you notice, it has very small spouts. They're only a couple of inches in diameter, so you can't get the water out very fast. So if you were trying to put out a fire, even though you have a lot of energy, you have a lot of water there sitting there, you can't get at it very quickly. In that situation, you might want this smaller yellow bucket because you can basically, you know, even though it only has a, you know, a couple of gallon of capacity, you can get access to all of that water, you know, pretty much immediately. And that's the same thing is true in batteries, is that if I put a big capacity battery, but a smaller inverter, um, you know, or a smaller C rate, you know, I can have a lot of capacity there and is good for certain applications, but other times I may need a lot of power. And I might want this ability to discharge very quickly, even though I'm not gonna be able to sustain it for a long period of time. So batteries are similar to, batteries are similar to, uh, to, to, buckets like in that sense 
is that you can't really say which one is better until you understand the application that you're trying to serve. Which takes us to energy storage applications. So depending on who you ask, there are somewhere between seven and 13 different applications that batteries can serve. And the reason there's different numbers is, is that people count them different ways. So I've got this, uh, the graphic here from Rocky Mountain Institute, which published a couple of years ago, a, uh, a, this, this graphic that shows the different applications of batteries, kind of broken down by whether they're customer services, utility services, or at the ISO level. And so to summarize those over here at the right, in terms of more of the, um, you know, the common ones that you'll see, are demand charge reduction, energy arbitrage or time shifting. So it being able to use energy at different periods uh, based on what it's worth. Providing ancillary services to the grid, which could include frequency response. Um, and below that then uh, demand response. Reliability, um, and under reliability, you might include things like energy security, resiliency, backup power, black start, um, and then capacity markets, and finally transmission and distribution upgrade deferral. And so while we were uh, chatting earlier, Tim you know, asked me like, what's the difference between uh, peak shaving and, and demand response? And I think that's an excellent question because in some ways they are, you know, they're two things that are happening, um, you know, that, that are, are very similar. You know, one of these is a customer side that's behind a meter, whereas a demand, that, that would be the peak shaving. And the demand response is really like when the utility asks you to reduce your load. And so, you know, that's really, you know, something to keep in mind here is that some of these you can do um, that might be happening, able to happen at the same time and other ones might not be. And that's really where we get into battery revenue stacking. So, you know, I, I say here batteries can serve one application at a time, but if you're lucky, you might actually be able to get two of them, depending like if a, you know, certain event, demand response event happened at the same time that you wanted to do your native peak shaving. Um, but, you know, most of them, like providing frequency response, you're going to have to do, you know, separately. So serving one application may preclude it from serving other applications at the same time or in the immediate future if, for example, the state of charge of your battery ends up lower after the previous application has been served. <coughs> so battery dispatch optimization is then the process of determining which applications a battery should serve and when it should serve them. And so down here at the bottom is, you know, a very, very hypothetical, you know, time frame of a day where you might be using a battery for doing different purposes, different, serving out different applications. And so maybe overnight you're doing arbitrage, you know, you're charging low um, to be able to get in position to do these others um, and have a full battery that's ready to, uh, or uh, to be able to serve these applications. Um, and so, you know, it's probably worth noting that, you know, some of these, you know, this is, this is kind of future looking that right now, I don't know of too many that are able to mix frequency regulation with peak shaving, for example. But, you know, as we go forward, you know, I think you're going to start to see more and more of that where you can bid into certain markets um, and then you can use your battery for other purposes during other hours of the day. So it's worth thinking about what that is, what that might look like, even though today you're still seeing lots of, you know, probably dedicated, um, you know, dedicated um, predominantly one, um, you know, one application. So, you know, moving on to, you know, what else, uh, you know, what drives, you know, if you were doing, you know, say a peak shaving application, for example, you know, how does it, you know, how do you interact with utility rate tariffs? And so this is, you know, this is a little bit of a, um, you know, it's, it's a primer on how utilities bill for electricity. And so typically there's, you know, there's three different, um, you know, three different charge types of charges, fixed charges, energy charges, and demand charges. And so a fixed charge, you know, looks like something that you pay, you know, a flat amount every month, sort of just for having the privilege of, you know, having electricity at your site, having that meter read, you know, having that, um, that capability. The energy charge, of course, you know, is what you pay per kilowatt hour. And so the solar, if you come from solar, you think a lot about energy charges because that's really the primary one that solar is able to offset is it's able to displace kilowatt hours at, you know, pretty much a one-to-one -one basis. 
Every kilowatt hour that solar generates, you don't have to buy from the grid. Well, then the next one down there is demand charges. And oftentimes that's what we're looking at the most um, with particularly behind the meter battery installations. And so the demand charge is the maximum rate at which you use energy. So that's your peak demand. And then your utility may assess a charge per kilowatt of what per month of whatever that was. And so if you look over here in the, the graphic over here, this site has a 1700 kilowatt peak demand, which is the maximum rate that they consumed electricity during that month. Of course, we're only showing one day here, but you know, that would, that is, that's, that's what the peak is. And so you can multiply that by 20 in order to calculate what their peak demand charge is. And of course, both the energy charges and these demand charges may be subject to time of use. They might be subject to lookbacks and ratchets and tiers, which all adds complexity to this and gives you more opportunity to optimize uh, around this space. So it's a, a question we often get is how prevalent are demand tariffs? How prevalent are these demand charges in the bills that organizations face. And so, you know, as consumers, from a residential perspective, we don't think too much about it because it's pretty uncommon to have a demand charge on the residential side. But when we start looking at the commercial and industrial space, you know, they're actually a lot more, um, you know, they're a lot more common and they, uh, they uh, you know, and, and they vary significantly in terms of what the maximum demand charge is. And so this graphic here by the National Renewable Energy Lab shows geographically what the peak demand charge is in each region. And so this is a, there's obviously there's a lot of, there's some, there's some simplification done behind the data set, which I'll mention you can go download if you're interested. But basically this is the peak of any rate tariff in that location um, and what it is. And so the darker is the higher. So you can see out here in California, there's a lot of places that have some, some rate tariff that has a peak over $30 per kilowatt. And as you look in different parts of the country, you know, it varies. You know, some of them, you know, there's, you know, there's this yellow down here at zero and it ranges to, you know, really, you know, anything in between. And so I've, I've highlighted over here because I know that we have a lot of interest, obviously, in Illinois here. Um, you know, what does Illinois look like? Well, you know, there's this, there's this orange up here around Chicago that's a $1 to $10. And there is some, you know, there's some peak down here, you know, in the south central part of the state that's, you know, up over 30. And so we say, well, you know, what does that mean? And there's, there's sort of a general rule in the, a rule of thumb in the space that if you have a peak demand charge somewhere around $14 or $15 per kilowatt, that you might have, you might have to be in the running to have a project. And so that's not a hard and fast rule. You know, I've seen projects that get, that can do uh, battery projects with demand charges down around 10. And I've seen ones that, you know, are up around 20 that because of oftentimes the shape of the load profile, it still doesn't work there. And so, you know, it's just a rule of thumb that, you know, if you see a, if you have a client that's, you know, peak demand charge somewhere around 15, that it's probably worth looking at batteries. Um, you know, that's kind of where the, uh, you know, the threshold starts. And so, you know, I've talked a lot about peak shaving here and I just, you know, I think that it's, you know, and what that, how it works with the, 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 uh, the, the load profile. And it's interesting to, uh, you know, to think about that from a, to make it a little more concrete by thinking about mountains. And, you know, partly we're a Colorado company. So these are, uh, you know, these mountains are dear and near and dear to our hearts. Um, they're the Colorado 14ers. Um, and so there are 14,000 foot peaks. This is actually Mount Yale at 14,199 feet. And if we were to think about, you know, wanting to do, do peak shading, you know, what does it mean? Well, there's this peak up here, right? And so, you know, doing a peak shave, if you wanted to get this a little bit lower, you would push some rocks off and push them over here to the side. And oftentimes our mountains have these, what are called cairns on top. And so there's, people have built these little, these little structures there, I don't know, they're like five feet high, four or five feet. Sometimes there's a dugout that you can get out of the wind because it's really windy up there. And so the first thing, if you wanted to lower this peak, you would just scatter those rocks around. And you could probably save four or five feet. You could shave four or five feet off the top of this mountain. And if for some reason someone was paying you $20 for each foot, you could make a hundred bucks. 
And I often say that, you know, you know, we joke about this, of course, but, you know, these are the collegiate peaks. And so, you know, there's legend has it that, you know, Harvard has, you know, you know paid students to come out once to, to make Mount Yale shorter so that Harvard would be taller. And so you can think about it like that if you want to. Well, so here's what the profile looks like of this. And so back to where, you know, the discussion here, that if you were to knock this pile down, first of all, you would, you would just knock the wee tippy top off of this and you really didn't have to do much work for it. But as you want to go further and further and further, suddenly now you need to have shovels and eventually you would need to have earth moving equipment. And eventually you're pushing, you're doing a lot of work to get every single foot off of this peak, right? And so that's kind of the same way that works with, with peak, shaving your electrical load profile is the first little bit is relatively simple. You don't need a lot of energy capacity because you're not doing, you're not moving a lot of energy around. And so it can be very lucrative. But the further you go down, just like with the mountain, the harder it is to do that, the bigger battery it takes because you need to move a lot more energy. And eventually you might think that the ultimate goal is to get this flat. Well, eventually you run out of places to put the dirt. And the same thing is true in, in peak shaving in terms of electrical load profiles. Eventually, you run out of places to shift energy. And at that point, there's just there's not too much you can do. And so that gets us to there's this optimal, right? There's this optimal level that you should have, that you should want to be able to do to maximize your project economics. And so like we've talked about here, you have these factors of what are the revenue streams that I want to go after? What are, what is my load profile look like? Um, you know, what does the cost of these technologies? You know, we haven't really mentioned that, but you know, the cost of, of batteries has declined significantly. Um, you know, where do those factor into? And so as you have these technologies and maybe you have even more at your site, you know, you probably already have solar. Um, you might even have, you know, other types of conventional generation. You might have some CHP. And so by bringing all this together, we are able to figure out what the optimal system sizing and dispatching is to maximize the net present value of this project. And that's really the goal of being able to drive the economics of these types of projects. So I think it can be useful to uh, go through a uh, brief case study of what this can look like. Um, this is a, uh, a case study that we've put together that's, uh, you know, for a site that's in um, uh, Los Angeles. And so this, uh, their utility down there is Southern California Edison, um, which is a, you know, it's a uh, progressive utility like many in California are in terms of what their, uh, their rate structures look like. Um, they have a time of use, uh, I'm sorry, they have an electrical load profile with a uh, interval data at 15 minute level. And so that's very useful when you're evaluating a uh, battery energy project. Um, it's, it's probably, it's not, there's a lot of parts of the country that don't have uh, time of use data yet. And so um, you might need to put a data logger at your site. Um, there's a variety of them out there that will record at, um, you know, minute level. And so you can get that data. Um, or your utility, of course, might have them. And I think we're going to see more and more and more of those smart meters get installed over the coming years. So the objective at this site was to analyze it, the site for energy storage potential and to determine the optimal battery sizing and dispatching with the applications of peak shaving and energy arbitrage such that they could maximize the uh, economic return of the project. And so what do, we, what do we need to know? Well, we mentioned the load profile. And so this is our load profile over here that has, um, has uh, for a week in July. Um, you can see that this is, you know, it's probably what you might expect for an office complex. Uh, you know, it picks up significantly during the day. Um, and then, you know, there's a bottom at night to it. And so you can see each one of these is like its own little mountain that, uh, that you might end up shaving. The other thing that you'll notice here is that these are what we call peaky. Um, they're, they're very jagged on top. And so that is actually very useful. Um, that's a very uh, useful bat load profile for batteries to operate on. Uh, if you have a load profile that's, that's got a flat top, you know, like we mentioned back with the mountain um, example earlier, is it's very, it's, it requires more energy to be able to do that. So when you see a profile like this that's really that's pointy, 
um, has tops to it, you know, that is a, uh, uh, something that you might want to look at for uh, batteries. So then we have some, you know, uh, installed cost assumptions. You know, we have to assume something, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, we're assuming, you know, $800 a kilowatt and $300 a kilowatt hour. And I make that distinction because it allows you to think about the duration that you need separately. So instead of just saying that I'm going to put in a two hour battery or I'm going to put in a four hour battery system, you know, maybe we want to think about, well, what is the characteristics of my load profile here? The applications that I'm going to serve and allow a model to figure this out for me um, mathematically. And so that's why we separate these out. And of course, you may have your own, uh, your own beliefs of what uh, you, know, you can get batteries for, and that's great. You can feed that into a model um, directly um, and, uh, you know, and have that factor in. Of course, we mentioned the available applications. And the next thing we wanna talk about is the utility rates. And so like I said, we're in SCE territory out here. Um, this is the uh, general service uh, three option B, um, but I think this is from perhaps a year ago. Um, so these numbers may not match up exactly today because that's another thing that rate tariffs change quite frequently, um, at least a little bit in terms of how they, uh, the, the specific numbers. And so the key to this rate tariff is that it is a time of use rate. And so if it looks complicated, that's because it is a little bit. Um, there's different rates for energy, um, which on here is labeled as usage, and demand. And these, they're different rates for different periods of the day and different seasons of the year. And so if we look over here at the summer period, we can see that this has a 14 cent per kilowatt hour usage during the afternoon hours from noon to 6 p.m. And they call that the peak period. And so you also pay a demand charge of $17.42 for the peak that happens during that period across the entire, uh, all the days of that month. And so you have say, um, you know, probably uh, 20 days that month and you have six hours each day. And so, you know, you have the peak of those roughly 120 hours, you're going to pay that $17.42 for. And then there's this part peak period down here that is kind of shoulder hours. And so they're the morning hours and the evening hours after that peak. And then the off peak is at night. And so the interesting aspect to SCE territory is that they then layer a monthly demand charge on top of that time of use demand charge. And so here you can see down here graphically that we've got this $17.42 per kilowatt in the peak period. But on top of that, there's a $17.81 for the peak of the whole month. And so if those happen at the same time, you actually have close to a $35 per kilowatt demand charge, which if we think back to our rule of thumb of 15, means we probably have a very good chance of a, of a, uh, of a viable battery project here. So how do we think about, you know, how do we go about actually running this, um, figuring out what the sizing? Well, like I mentioned, we have our Red Cloud um, energy optimization platform that we can feed in what these loads are, these costs, um, these utility costs, um, I'm sorry, the capital costs of the equipment, the utility costs and the rate structure, and then the specifications of it, you know, specifics of, you know, how fast can we charge the battery? You know, what is the cycle life, for example? And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, details of the uh, actual um, equipment that you want to be mindful of. And then over here you get, well, what is, you know, what is my output? And so, you know, in this case, our model found that a one and a half hour battery actually maximizes this, your NPV down here, which was, you know, in this case about $188,000. Um, and it breaks down, you know, what is the demand savings? You know, most of this savings, first year savings is coming from demand charge reduction. There's a little bit of energy savings. So that's the arbitrage aspect. Of, sh of charging the battery during off-peak periods and then doing demand charge reduction and as a consequence, you know, energy time shifting um, during the, uh, the peak period. And, you know, it's worth, you know, the, here that noting that, you know, this is, this is a one and a half hour battery. Um, you know, this is, you know, it's, uh, you could do a two or you could do a four hour battery, but to be able to drive that maximum, maximize the MPV, you know, based on the assumptions that we put into this, you know, we find that a one and a half hour battery here is optimal.
So then let's look at dispatching. If you remember, I said that so much of this really comes down to how you dispatch these systems. And so this is the projected dispatching that comes out of our red cloud model. And so over here at the, uh, in this chart, you can see a, what is a, that load profile, and this is now one day. And so you can see this, you know, this is the, the shape of it. And one way or the other, you need to have this all filled in. And so mostly this is still filled in, you know, with a gray color, meaning that it's, you're buying electricity from the grid. Um, but what we're doing here, and this is just a battery project, by the way, for simplicity. Obviously, you could add solar to this, and we'll show that in a moment. But, you know, this is just the battery side. Um, the battery up here is being used for demand charge reduction. And the model finds out that this is the optimal level. This dashed line right here is the optimal amount of peak shaving that you should do. If you try to do more than that with this current size of battery, you'll run out of energy at the end of the day. And that's not good because if you run out of energy, then before your load goes back down, um, you're, you're gonna end up with a demand charge there that you didn't expect and probably all your good work that you did earlier in the day will go for naught. Another thing to note here is you know, that we're doing some in the park peak. And so even though this back here was only worth you know, three or $4 per kilowatt compared to the 20 right next to it, there's still benefit to being able to operate in that period. Because as you can see, we didn't have to do very much. And so even though we only got paid $3 per kilowatt for that reduction, we didn't have to work very hard to get it. And that's part of that optimization is figuring out what is I should do and when I should do it even though it's not always, because it's not always obvious what those answers are. It's also worth noting here, it's over here in the bullets, that there's, uh, there's actually 20 different demand periods, you know, through this 12 month um, time. And that's because you have a monthly for the 12 months, and then you have this peak and part peak added onto that for the four summer months. And so the model is simultaneously figuring out all of these 20 demand periods and the charging and the discharging that it should do for all 35,040 time steps um, throughout the year. So here's another day, um, you know, of what's going on. You can see that, you know, a different day, there's actually, you know, there was more arbitrage. Um, you know, it just said, okay, I'm going to shave that peak, but then I'm going to discharge the battery later in the day. And so that's kind of the, the, the uh, you know, that's kind of the beauty of using a model like this is that it's not a canned algorithm, that I can change this strategy based on what my load is doing um, on different days or you know, what different revenue streams are available. This slide shows then you know, where do my savings come from. Um, you, know, you can see that there's the, the green down here is that monthly demand charge. So there was $17 per month every single month. And, um, you know, so there's, there's, there's uh, many months it's getting the, the, the full 310 kilowatt savings on that. And then during the summer is really kind of when this battery makes, you know, the, the, the bigger chunk of its savings because it's also operating, you know, it's doing a lot of peak during that peak period and the part peak period. And so you really, you know, one of the things you see from this is you really want to have the battery operating during June through September. Um, if for some reason you had to take this offline, um, or something happens, you know, those months would not be the time to do it because there's a lot of savings to be had. You know, maybe you want to aim for one of these shoulder months, you know, when there's, uh, you know, when there's different, um, you know, different amounts to be saved. So, you know, we then ran a case two here just to, you know, transition to, you know, show the difference. You know, how does it change based on if I were to put a four hour system? Because depending on what vendor you look at, you may only have a four hour system, and so you could be locked into that. Well, you can see that down here, you, uh, in the demand charge row, you do get more demand charge savings. So putting in a four hour battery versus a one and a half hour battery is definitely going to save you more money. It just, it costs a lot more. So the cost of this is, you know, roughly twice as much to get a four hour battery versus a two hour battery. But the savings isn't twice as much. And so that's what pulled down the IRR and the NPV. Now don't get me wrong. I mean, a 15% IRR, you should still be able to do this project, but you might have left money on the table by not being able to optimize and get the right size battery for the application and the rate tariff, the load profile and the prevailing rate tariff.
Just something to keep in mind. So if we compare those dispatches, um, you know, what is the one and a half hour versus the four hour look like? You know, this shows graphically what I just said, that you get more, you're going to do more peak shape. You're going to get more reduction. You're going to pull that peak lower, but you can see now that there's just, there's more red there. So as you bring that dashed line lower and lower, you need, you're going the entire width of that. Whereas over here on the left side, in the case one, you can see that the model kind of found that I really want to stop once I get to the edge of these jagged points. Once I go any further, you know, now I need a lot more energy. And so that's, you know, what really, you know, what, why it stopped, you know, conceptually, one of the reasons that it stopped there. So then you can, of course, do the savings comparison. You can see the breakdown. Um, you know, you can get all the analytics out of the model. You can show, you know, what the, uh, you know, what does the cycling look like? We haven't talked about that, but that's something that you should want to factor in so that you can think about what the uh, lifetime of the battery is going to look like. Um, you know, be able to factor that in in terms of degradation and, you know, whether this is, you know, what the use of the battery looks like. Um, so then uh, uh, you say, well, you know, you can add solar plus storage to this. <clears throat> um, you can add solar to it, of course. How does that factor in? Well, now you've got solar that's operating during through much of that peak period. It's providing that energy um, to be able to, uh, uh, it's providing a lot of that energy in that region that the battery didn't have to do. And so storage is very complementary. It's, they say it's synergistic with solar because like I mentioned earlier, batteries like those peaky load profiles. They like that jaggedness. Well, guess what? That solar will create some of that jaggedness for you because every time that cloud goes over that you get some sort of dip like that. And that's where that battery can smooth out those peaks and pull down, you know, whereas, Solar was getting a little bit of demand charge reduction before. Now you add the battery to it and it can smooth that out and it can get even, it can increase the amount of that, that, that peak shaving um, without having to add significant sized energy capacity to it. So to go back to some of those uh, takeaways um, as I uh, wrap up, um, you know, what, uh, you know, we had in this uh, presentation is to remember to think about power and energy when talking about batteries. And I really can't emphasize that enough, is that when you read about batteries and you read about in your trade journals that, you know, so-and-so utility did this size of battery, you know, think about, you know, well, what was the application and what was the, both the power and the energy that was required to do it? What size battery did they put in? I think we mentioned several times that batteries like high demand charges and they like peaky load profiles. Solar will help you make that peaky load profile and that's what makes the complementary aspect between solar and storage. Not only is battery sizing important, but dispatching is critically important um, in terms of optimizing that and, the, and optimizing your economics that can make or break a project. And finally, it's a fascinating time in the field of energy. I promise you all, that when we look back on this in five or 10 or 20 years, the things that we were doing now, you're going to be amazed at the different, um, you know, where we were and the tools that we were developing to be able to think about these projects. Thank you, Travis. Uh, we have a few minutes for Q and A and if we go over one o'clock, that's okay too. We got a little bit of a late start uh, due to technical difficulties, but um, so feel free to type your questions into the uh, Q&A function there at the bottom of your screen, uh, or you can chat them into the, the chat function also. Uh, I know, Mike, you had a question about uh, peak shaving. So if you could just repeat that question. I didn't quite understand the context uh, when you fired that off. But uh, Travis, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Midwest market and, and some other things like resiliency. Um, you've talked a lot about grid services, which is very important, and, and thank you for such a deep dive. But, um, you know, one of the challenges we face is that demand charges are very low here in the Midwest. And so we're always looking for other value stacks to make batteries pencil or make them economical.
I'll give you an example. Uh, if a factory needs ride through power, the ability to ride through during a brownout or blackout and avoid an uncontrolled shutdown, that can be worth a lot of money for a manufacturer. And that's often uh, the case where we really get traction with uh, lithium ion storage because that's now a viable solution for uh, short term ride through, you know, on, on the order of 30 minutes to an hour. Resiliency obviously is another value stack which we don't necessarily appreciate a whole lot. Um, outages are fairly rare when they do happen, of course, uh, because of some natural, you know, storm event, storm event or catastrophe, um, then the grid is sorely missed. Talk a little bit about resiliency and, and does Red Cloud allow you to model resiliency? Yeah, those are definitely good. Um, you know, it's good questions, Tim. And, and we do a lot with resiliency. Um, the challenge is, to be perfectly honest, is valuing it. And so you really hit the nail on the head with the customers that it is very important to the ones that can tell you what an hour of downtime for their facility is worth are the ones that are very well positioned to be able to either to do some either resiliency from batteries or solar plus storage and possibly even adding those to their existing firm generation. And so if you can value the, if you know what the resiliency is worth to you, you know very well what you're willing to pay for solutions that will provide it. And so that's kind of the key. Um, it's, uh, uh, so yeah, so, so um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, what, how we like to think about it is, you know, doing the modeling of what solar plus storage will add um, when you do those, uh, um, uh, when you add it to say diesel generation. And so like diesel generation, oftentimes if it's a backup facility, you know, backup power at a facility, you might say, well, I have three hours of, of uh, you know, I want, I want to have, or three days, I want to have a, I have a finite capacity tank and I'm going to have a certain amount of fuel on site that will ride me through that type of, of that, that duration of outage. But of course you could have an outage that's longer than that. And so, what is so then solar plus storage could bring that incremental resiliency and say well you know i'm going to either make this i'm going to run, need to run the generator less or i'm going to run it at a lower load and so by doing that you know if i had 3 days or 3 hours of fuel before you know maybe i'm going to be able to double that and so maybe now i'm going to have say 6 days of fuel if i'm at a you know at i'm at a you know, assisted care facility um, or something like that. And so if a, if a hurricane hits or a, you know, I suppose in, in Illinois, a blizzard, um, that, you know, suddenly now that your fuel supply lines become endangered, you know, maybe now you have a longer um, period of, um, you know, of, of resiliency. Great. We have a question from Mayhul. Does battery, does the battery cost of $300 a KWH and $800 per KW include inverters and control and monitoring components? I guess you yeah, can see uh, one of your slides. Yeah, for sure. Um, so <laughs> that's always a good, uh, you know, it's, it, we can usually get some questions off of that slide. And so, um, gen yeah, so it, it's, it's designed to include the, uh, the bi-directional inverter. And the fixed, you know, in some, the, the, the switch gear, for example, that you're going to put at a site. And so, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, what you should have in your per kilowatt number. So you should be billing, you should be costing the, uh, the inverter on that per kilowatt number largely and the batteries on the per kilowatt hour number. So then the, uh, the controller is, is kind of the wild card um, in terms of what that's going to cost. And so if you get big enough, the controller is, you know, it can be somewhat negligible. You know, it gets, you know, it's, it's in the noise. And that's, it, but it can be a challenge on the smaller systems because the controller may not scale down. And so there's a variety in, in terms of cost. And so there's, there are different solutions out there and there's more coming all the time 
that I think are going to be able to, uh, um, that you can, like we are, for example, working with a hardware partner that can integrate some of that control capability to be able to do behind the meter peak shaving into their smart inverters, such that you don't have a separate controller. And so, you know, being able to do that then allows you to, you know, use that type of, you know, use that, those costs, roughly those cost numbers um, that we have there without adding a separate controller. But, you know, one way or the other, you know, you obviously need to see the entire system cost. Cool. Mike has a question. Uh, early in the presentation, you referenced the conversation that you and I had about um, the difference between peak shaving and other services that the battery provides. One of those services had demand in the name, but it wasn't demand charge reduction. Let's, let's just quickly review that value stack that you were referring to. Um, do you, should we go back to that slide? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, great. I think you just passed it. Yeah, I think it's right there. Yep. Um, so, so what was the question here? It was, um, it was actually, if you go to the next slide, um, right here. So we've got arbitrage, frequency regulation, demand response, and peak shaving. Can you quickly differentiate those services? Sure. So if we, uh, so why don't we, use, we can use the ones that are, um, you know, in the, uh, the, 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 the stack up there. So ancillary services are usually one, like, so frequency regulation is usually the one that's most common in that regard. Um, but that's also going to include, um, it, could in, it could include capacity, it could include black start, um, that uh, different ISOs are, uh, allow you to uh, bid um, to provide that. So basically these are services that are getting provided to the grid in general. Um, going across then grid infrastructure, congestion relief. So there's, there's peak shaving that is done from a utility perspective uh, that, uh, um, that certain feeders get overloaded. And so being able to reduce the load on some of those uh, particular feeders, you know, definitely has value. And so that's ones that are, you not, it's, it can be difficult to see from a particular project that you need to work with the utility in order to capture some of that revenue. That there's value to them for you doing this, but there's not necessarily a market to monetize it, if that makes sense. Um, like, so reliability and resiliency, um, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, what you can do in terms of, um, you know, backup power. Um, you know, there's also value to the utility from this respect. You know, they have their uh, CAFI and uh, um, SAFI, I think, numbers that uh, show like uh, the outage frequency and duration. And so they have metrics that they need to hit in terms of providing resiliency, um, having outages. And so, you know, you'll see, uh, you know, I think there's some projects up in Washington State, for example, that they've done battery projects and position them such that, you know, uh, communities at the end of long feeders that have been prone to outages are no longer, um, that, you know, have some backup capabilities there. And so, you know, there's the, there's the line between, well, what's a front of the meter project and a behind the meter project. And, you know, today those lines are pretty solid. And I think that you're going to see more of that blurring in the future. Um, and then demand charge reduction we mentioned and energy time shifting, you know, is pure energy arbitrage is, is relatively rarer in the U.S. Um, and the reason for that is, is you need to have large, a large dynamic range um, between your, basically it's your bid ask spread to put another way. So what is your electricity cost at night versus during the day? And if you have that, you obviously need it to be large, right? Because you're losing some energy straight off the bat through a round trip efficiency of the battery. But then you're, in, you're introducing wear and tear on the battery. Every cycle costs you um, wear and tear, which shortens the life of the battery. And so you need to have this, you know, as some multiple. And in the U.S., we often don't have that big a multiple. Whereas in Australia, I believe that they have, you know, these can get, this could actually get fairly large. 
And so, you know, certain parts of the world have more opportunity for pure arbitrage. Um, here in the U.S., I think it's more about like shifting your solar, for example. Um, you could say, well, I'm, I have, I'm producing solar in the morning and I have, you know, this, my part peak rate, as you saw there in SCE was, you know, say six cents. And maybe I, uh, you know, I don't have, or maybe I have an export rate that's even lower. So I'm going to shift that, um, you know, into the afternoon. And so usually I think in the U.S. we're seeing that, you know, energy time shifting, you know, arbitrage is combined with, you know, something else you were going to be doing like peak shaving. And so it makes sense, you know, it's part of the stack. It's just, you know, and, and kind of the point is you're probably not doing, you know, you're, you're not doing it by itself um, exclusively. And to Mike's question, we were differentiating peak shaving from demand response. And uh, as I understand it, peak shaving is like capacity charge reduction or demand charge reduction. So when we're having peak load days, we're doing something explicit with the battery and other uh, aspects of the facility to reduce our de demand to, to the grid. And then demand response is specifically a program that utilities have, like ComEd does have a demand response program where you agree to uh, offer some service like generator uh, services to your facility to reduce the load that the facility presents to the grid and the utility will pay you for whatever time slot you provide services. Is that relatively accurate that's right yep that's a uh it's it's the uh the peak shaving you're doing because it's your bill and it's savings i usually say that peak shaving things you do on your bill you don't really face competition for it's not a it's your bill you own it no one else is coming to pay you to is going to pay your bill and so whatever your load profile looks like you have the opportunity to reduce those charges on your bill. And so when it's demand response, it's the utility paying you, saying, hey, I will give you, um, I will give you, pay you this if you can, uh, you know, reduce your load during that period. And it's, you know, it's voluntary and it turns out to be, it's a, it's a payment. And so really, you know, you're in a great position if your peak happens to coincide with when that demand response um, event was going to occur because then you can do what you were going to do anyway for your own peak shaving and simultaneously get paid for reducing your load through some sort of demand response program that your utility offers. Great. Um, there's a question from Steve about the presentation. Uh, will we make it available? And the answer is yes. We, we always post the slides and the recording at seco.com cecco.com forward slash solar webinar so that's the landing page for this for the webinar we will post the slides there and then um you know here at continental we do work with batteries we've installed oh a uh, few more than half a dozen projects and it's a variety of reasons but uh frequency regulation is the most common service that batteries are providing, you know, kind of a revenue generating service. And then ride through is another key service. And, and you know, we, we didn't necessarily talk about this, but when you combine solar and storage, you can take the investment tax credit, which is a, currently a 30% tax credit on that storage equipment. So that is definitely something to look into if you're investing in solar you should look into investing in solar and storage, which uh, basically you're expanding the capabilities of the solar array by pairing it with a battery storage system. And then also uh, taking some tax benefits. Travis, tell us a little bit about um, how people can get a hold of you and how you work. Sure, yeah. So you, I would uh, encourage you to uh, visit our website, um, mugrid.com. Um, I, uh, we're also on, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and, uh, you can find us there as well. 
Um, we, uh, we get involved in a variety of projects. Um, we're often on a, uh, you know, a project basis that we're uh, brought in for our uh, modeling expertise, uh, you know, right through to preliminary design. Um, we also do some performance monitoring uh, to be able to, uh, you know, it, it, it's the beauty of a battery is that, you know, even once it's in the ground, um, you can still, uh, you can improve your economics by improving your dispatching. So, you know, it's something that is a, you know, you should, you know, you want to continually think about um, as you're doing. And so, yeah, so we're, uh, you know, we're happy to talk about, um, you know, solar projects, storage, we do lots of storage projects, um, uh, you know, really, you know, sort of any, uh, you know, any energy, uh, you know, uh, that's, you know, the, the tough questions, um, you know, revolving around uh, energy, we're happy to uh, engage with and, you know, see how we can help out. Can you forward to the next slide and uh, make a few announcements of upcoming events? Uh, yeah, sorry, to the uh, second to last slide. So I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Travis. Uh, again, people can um, get the slides on the Continental website. We do have a couple of upcoming events that we'd like you to know about. Solar Power Midwest is coming up in just two weeks in Chicago. That's November 13 to 15. The main event is the 14th and 15th. Uh, please do reach out to me if you'd like to get a pass to the trade show. We do have a number of free passes to the trade show where you can visit with manufacturers, service providers, installers like ourselves. We will have a booth uh, and, and other uh, organizations in the renewable energy industry. So that's a great event, three-day event. The, uh, on the 13th, there's a number of pre-con events. So check out uh, if you just Google Solar Power Midwest or if you follow the link on the posted slide, you'll find that. Uh, this Thursday, we do have our Chicago Solar and Storage Meetup at Continental in Oak Brook. We meet the first Thursday of the month at Continental. And this week, we will be uh, discussing solar and storage uh, and recapping Travis's presentation, as well as doing a rooftop tour of our 55KW rooftop array at Continental. And then finally, SolarWorks for Illinois is a monthly webinar. We uh, give a webinar on the last Thursday, sorry, last Tuesday of the month. So the next one is November 27th. And that is going to be Intelligent Monitoring Systems for Solar Projects and Portfolios with Anson Moran, who is the CEO of Meteo Control North America. And Meteo Control is a leader in the uh, monitoring of renewable energy assets industry. So we're excited to have Anson on the show. Thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Again, thank you so much, Travis, for being our speaker today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tim. It's been a pleasure. All right. You take care. Bye, everybody.